recording. Uh, my name is Paul Rosenzweig. I'm a senior fellow at the R Street Institute, uh, and I'm just going to hold uh, for a second, uh, maybe a minute or two more, let some more people join. Uh, we started it now so that you knew that we were here uh, and that uh, uh, you weren't um, uh, you weren't alone in this, uh, but uh, uh, we'll wait and we'll see uh, a few more people coming, okay? Uh, so I, I, I see the attending list is growing. So we're just gonna hold for a second here um, while people join the meeting. Um, I suppose I could keep talking. Uh, anybody know any good jokes? No, that's probably an in inappropriate way to start a, a webinar. Um, I must say this is an unusual way to start an event, right? Not even being able to see how many people are in the room watching. Uh, I can see a count of it, right? We're up to 12, 15, you know, it's growing, but uh, um, uh, we had about- I used to, uh, Paul, um, so, uh, I'm used to, of course, like all of us, we're used to giving talks in person where you can see and interact with the audience. And I'd always been very skeptical of doing the online thing um, until I did my, my first virtual conference last month with uh, Wild West Hackcast. And uh, I have to say, it was really interesting that to get a lot more interaction with folks, the way that they were able to ask questions simultaneously without interrupting the talk through chat. Um, so I think it was a really interesting experience. Well, that is an interesting experience. So, um, so I'm going to start uh, talking now a little bit about uh, the mechanics of this. Um, uh, we, you will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. Uh, anybody who has a question at any time during the discussion, should type it into the Q&A screen. I'll have that up so will the other participants. They may answer it on the fly or they may hold answers till afterwards. We will have a, a uh, formal Q&A session after the presentations. So, so please feel free to um, uh, either hold your questions or type them in now. We'll get to them either way. So that, that's the mechanics of this. Uh, do an introduction now, and then we'll have each of the uh, other two panelists speak for 15 minutes or so uh, about their perspectives on uh, the topic, and uh, then we'll turn to q and I imagine we'll go for about an hour, but there's neither a hard deadline nor, um, uh, nor a soft one, so if we run out of things to say, we'll end early, and if we have more things to say, we'll just keep going until... Uh, until it's lunchtime and everybody wants to do something. So uh, with that kind of admin uh, out of the way, uh, let me begin. As I said earlier, my name is Paul Rosenzweig. I'm a senior fellow at the R Street Institute uh, and I am your host today for today's webinar topic, which is uh, cybersecurity in the time of pandemic. Uh, lessons basically for uh, small businesses and individual users. I'm joined on the panel today by uh, two of, uh, of the most brilliant uh, colleagues I have, uh, Bryson Bort. Bryson is a fellow, is it fellow or senior fellow? At, senior uh, fellow. At, senior fellow at R Street Institute. He is also um, the uh, founder of a uh, cybersecurity company called Sci, and uh, the CEO of a nonprofit called um, the ICS Village, right? Did I get that right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, I I ICS Village, which is a nonprofit that tries to explain uh, hacking, technical hacking concepts to policy and uh, wonks and congressmen. My favorite of their events is ha uh, Hack the Capitol, which is an annual event where they break into Congress and, uh, and show the <laughs> how bad it is. Um, 
The other panelist who will be joining us is Phil Reitinger. Phil is the CEO of the Global Cyber Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, uh, providing tools <coughs> for uh, enhanced cybersecurity to small and medium businesses, giving them uh, uh, concepts and, and, and things to work with that, are, uh, that would be available at relatively uh, easy application, relatively low cost. Um, so we have three organizations here, R Street, uh, ICS, and uh, ICS Village, and Global Cyber Alliance. In addition, just as a shout out in case he's listening, uh, all three of us are affiliated with the George Mason National, Cyber, uh, National Security Institute. Uh, Phil and I are on the board, and Bryson is a fellow there as well. Um, so our topic today is uh, basically what's changed. All of a sudden, in place of uh, in-person meetings and phone calls and email discussions and maybe some Google Docs, we have leapt into a world where everybody is doing everything by Zoom or by other forms of at a distance communication. Uh, in rushing to implement this kind of complete change in how we conduct business in America and frankly around the globe, um, there is some concern that we have uh, rushed to adopt technologies that are insecure. Uh, to some degree, as, as I think the panelists will tell you, that's uh, an accurate assessment, but to other, in other ways, that's perhaps a bit of an overstatement of the problem, a bit, a bit of a uh, hair on fire fear uh, concept. The discussion today is uh, to try and ground our, uh, our uh, response to this new circumstance in a better sense of reality, a better sense of what the real threats are, who the real threat actors are, what the real vulnerabilities are, what the real consequences of failure are. In, in, in short, what a legitimate risk assessment of a cyber enabled workplace looks like today and how that differs from what it looked like uh, two months ago when, uh, when we were already on our way to a, uh, a more at a distance uh, uh, communication system. But now we've kind of leapt that in a fast forward. So we're gonna assess first the, the risk environment, the threat environment, and then we're gonna assess what sorts of tools are available to actually mitigate those risks, uh, to reduce them uh, hopefully to acceptable levels so that we all um, can respond to the, what this pandemic crisis with, uh, I guess what I would call a realistic appraisal of the costs and benefits. Um, to put it in the simplest form uh, that I know, you know uh, I, uh, we're all isolated. My family just went through Passover and Easter on Zoom and all of my family members were, were hair on fire about what if people Zoom bomb us? And I, I said, it's okay. I said a password, don't worry. Nobody, and, and you know, we're obscure, nobody's gonna come in and join us. So that was a, a, a kind of the, the fear, uncertainty and doubt response. And today what we're gonna try and do is demystify it and give everybody on the, on the call a sense of what the realities are and a sense of how we can uh, mitigate those realities. So I'm gonna start now by turning it over to Bryson uh, for a discussion of essentially uh, what the threat environment looks like, a hacker's perspective, how, what's new, what vulnerabilities are new and serious, what vulnerabilities are new and not so serious. Bryson, over to you. All right, thank you, Paul. So first, it's not like the pandemic has suddenly unleashed these vulnerabilities that we didn't know about and the entire landscape has completely shifted. Um, what has primarily shifted, of course, is that all of us suddenly overnight had to start working on a different infrastructure. Before, we worked at our business, we worked at our enterprise, and the IT staff there provided an entire support system around us being able to do the work that we were doing. Then, you're at home. Now what? Not everybody had virtual private networks set up to be able to safely log in. Folks are now working on personal computers and IT is scrambling to catch up. Now, hackers on the other hand, not ones to miss any opportunity. 
And what we have with the COVID pandemic is opportunity in several ways. First is fear. Fear helps an attacker get access to you because we tend to do things when, you know, when we're afraid that we haven't fully thought through. And so attackers are working to take advantage of that. Um, so Zoom, of course, Zoom is on everybody's mind. And this first started when a researcher named Patrick Wardle, ex-NSA, of course, um, found a couple of vulnerabilities where if you were installing in a, an environment that had already been compromised, or if somebody was already in your Zoom, they would be able to provide malicious links. Now, these links aren't the kind of web links that everybody's used to seeing. They were what was called UNC links which was a specific Microsoft file path system that was able to get around defenses. So basically, if you're already compromised or if somebody bad was on there, posted a link and then you clicked it, they were able to take advantage of that. And those are not the kinds of things the average user needs to worry about. Since then, we've now seen that on the black market, there are a couple of zero days that are available. So for folks at home, a zero day is a vulnerability in a system that is not patchable, right? We now have this secret way in. But for the most of us, don't worry about it. Zero days are a common thing. They're very expensive. They're difficult to use. And they're shortly, usually short-lived. They're not the kind of thing on average that you're going to see attacking the population writ large. Um, and then the final part of Zoom was the Zoom bombing, which is if somebody had access to your meeting ID, they could just jump in and get in. Since then, Zoom has made it a lot easier to control who comes in, um, providing passwords, and lots of things that prevent that. I do want to give a shout out to Zoom, though, because I think this is a case study in response from an IT security perspective. They took it seriously. They got ahead of the narrative. They've already put together a task force and a whole bug bounty program around making it better. Um, so I do want to give kudos to that because I think in the information security community, it's a lot, it's very easy to take shots at things, but being on that other side, we should recognize a good response when we see it. Um, okay. One of the other things that we've seen is domain masquerading. So domain masquerading is where I create a web link that looks very similar to something that you might link to. So for example, www.zoom.com, right? Um, or maybe it's www.zoom. And it has a strange backend like IT where perhaps Zoom hasn't registered themselves. Um, so we need to be aware that folks are going to be continuing to use techniques that we've seen before. But the key here is now they're using lures that get the user to interact. And a lot of the common lures that we see, of course, are going to be around the fact that COVID-19 is on everyone's mind. So some ideas around that are, for example, if you got something from an address that looked like it was like a hospital or the World Health Organization or the government that said test results and had malware in it inside of a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, a user might be inclined to click that. And we've seen those kinds of things. Uh, we've also seen that where folks try to use phishing through um, work-like emails and the same kind of thing where we have embedded malware inside of Microsoft documents um, for like lists of infected employees so that you can see if you might be infected as well. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen is fake apps pushed out on the App Store which have COVID or pandemic-like themes. Um, it's worth noting that this is still just a small percentage of the kind of phishing attacks that we're seeing out in the wild. It's still just a few percentage points out of all of the malware that's being pushed, but this is something that's increasing. Um, there has been some minor small silver linings, if you can take them at their face value, is that a couple of criminal organizations have publicly declared that they're not going to be attacking healthcare during the pandemic. So if we believe them, that's great. On the other hand, other criminal organizations, of course, are trying to take advantage of the pandemic and are attacking healthcare organizations, which ties to the fact that year over year, we've seen increasing amounts of ransomware, both in the number of ransomware campaigns, the success of those ransomware campaigns, 
and the amount of money that victims are willing to pay to get their information back from ransomware. So why does this stuff work? So I think the greatest example, which is something we're all familiar with, is when you get that email from the Nigerian prince. Nigerian spam is common. So the first thing that's noticeable about Nigerian spam is the poor English and the poor grammar. And yet, it still works. And the question is, why? So the first thing that I like to point out to folks is the scammers speak perfect English. They are intentionally seeding their phishing with bad English because they know that somebody who's going to click on that is going to be a higher chance of success for being able to be robbed. They've self-selected themselves as somebody who believes a poorly written email out of nowhere is a legitimate chance at $10 million. And so I just want to contrast that, that those principles are still there, now masked by this COVID-19 pandemic kind of template on top of it. Don't let fear overcome what still should be a natural sense. Disinformation. So certainly since the 2016 election, disinformation has been on Americans' minds. And it hasn't gone away. What we see now are, of course, that Russia has continued its disinformation campaign and has been pushing some narratives around um, that COVID was a weapon. COVID was originally developed as a bioweapon in U.S. labs. That cellular 5G technology is a vector for spreading COVID. Um, also continuing to push the anti-vaccine with homeopathic remedies as a solution. So continuing to sow distrust in basic norms and our government. China has now started to pivot from this. We saw a shift in China's disinformation campaigns with the issues in Hong Kong the other year, where they started moving from just using disinformation in a way of controlling their own population to where they were trying to control the narrative around Hong Kong, to now they're copying the tactics that we've seen Russia use for disinformation, where they are no longer trying to necessarily control narratives so much as push disinformation and misinformation along those similar lines to sow confusion and chaos um, in their adversaries. Back to you, Paul. Ah, okay, I, I didn't know, I didn't know, didn't realize that was the back to me throw. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a, a great one. So, so we've kind of got, kind of got three buckets there, if I will. You know, there's the disinformation bucket. Uh, there's the enhanced criminality fish uh, bucket, which includes both phishing and ransomware. And then there's the technical insecurity of our tools bucket, which includes Zoom and and uh, and presumably uh, any other uh, web-based communication system is also potentially vulnerable, right? Right. So, and again, I, I'd like to point out, it's not that Zoom is bad or that any other web conferencing software is inherently flawed. Um, there is nothing on this planet that is unhackable. It's a question of the vendor's ability to respond within the life cycle of operation, to identify a problem, make the patch, and then deploy it to fix the problem. Keep in mind, all of this software is on somebody else's infrastructure. So we've seen things about, oh, you know, Zoom's been routed through China, um, or it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter per se, right? There's sort of the, the boogeyman reference there. At the end of the day, you're using somebody else's infrastructure. That's what the cloud is. Actually, before I throw it to Phil, I want to ask you about that specifically because the most recent person who used China as a bit of a boogeyman was actually no, no less than Speaker Nancy Pelosi who said that she was opposed to uh, at a distance congressional hearings and voting, uh, you, at least using Zoom in part because Zoom was uh, uh, based on Chinese infrastructure. Would you say that's a realistic concern, Bryson, or, or should, should somebody go talk to the speaker and kind of tell her not to use that talking point? <laughs> so, uh Certainly, it's a concern, but I think the, the real narrative there is that, I mean, Zoom was meant for convenience and simplicity. It wasn't meant to be secure messaging. And so anything that is of critical importance or sensitive 
um, you should not be conducting it over that kind of platform, no matter what it is. Yeah, I think that's fair. So in other words, no national security secrets or congressional voting on Zoom, please. Uh, or any generic web conferencing. Okay. So uh, with that as an introduction to the, uh, to the uh, threat environment and how it's changing, uh, let me turn it over to you, Phil, and ask uh, <clears throat> you to give us uh, some thoughts on uh, best practices for small businesses, for, for individual users, and uh, uh, what they should be doing now today from your perspective at, at GCA. Sure. Thanks very much, Paul. And I, I think I'll start from where some of the things that Bryson was talking about. As, as he said, you know, and it's often the case in cybersecurity, right? There's nothing really new under the sun. Um, hackers for a long time, scammers for a long time have taken advantage of um, natural disasters and events like that. What's different here is there are a bunch of things coming together. One, they'd already built the infrastructure to do disaster related scamming, and it's really easy to repurpose it to a new event. Second, we've got here an event that is gonna be much longer lasting than a typical natural disaster is, you know, where you've got a month or two maybe of um, high degree of focus and then it ramps down. And then we're also, again, as Bryson talked about, an entirely new um, infrastructure environment where we had a lot more people before who were inside the corporate firewall and subject to a whole series of um, internal security measures where they still may be subject to internal security measures, but working remotely, those are often going to be less effective and there's going to be a new attack surface area. So what do you do about that? Um, I, I'll start by saying you know, we've, our advice has been you know, generally that folks should focus on hygiene. Um, and what I mean by cyber hygiene is sort of, you know, we're out there in the pandemic, right? And everybody's washing their hands. I'm putting lotion on my hands five times a day just to keep them from bleeding, right? So we've got to do the same sort of things in cybersecurity in this new environment because everybody's you know, taking care of their kids at home. They're trying to work from home and they don't have a huge amount of time to do a bunch of things. So We've even narrowed our hygiene advice to people to suggest that they do at least start with three very specific things. Um, and they're all things that you ought to do anyway, but they're even more important in this distributed environment. Um, the first thing that people ought to do is patch and update their systems. Um, and formerly, you know, a lot of times this was handled by the corporate environment, but if you're using from you know, a, if you're accessing from a home computer on your home network, you might be doing responsible for doing that patching. And you might also have to worry about your router and is your router fully up to date? Because some, especially some older routers don't automatically update. So you need to really, really patch your system so as not to make it easy for the bad guys. A couple of quick examples there. Um, you know, Bryson talked about Zoom. Paul, you talked about Zoom. There were a lot of issues that came out with Zoom. Zoom did in fact react pretty quickly um, and issue patches for the ones that were made available. But those patches don't do you a whole lot of good unless you install the new Zoom client. Now, fortunately with a cloud-based service, that sort of thing can often happen automatically, but it's really important to make sure you're running the most up-to-date software. Also, two days ago, um, Microsoft Patch Tuesday, Microsoft issued a, a bunch of additional patches, including for critical vulnerabilities. That's really important, especially if you're on home machines, to make sure you're auto-updating your systems and you're installing those patches. So you are not going to make it really, really easy for bad guys to attack you. The second piece of advice I'd offer is, if it's possible, use multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication or other strong authentication. So um, this is really the most effective thing you can do to prevent phishing. So it's, you know, even if somebody gets your password, they may not have the other information like a token or a soft token or your phone that you need to get access to a system. If you are accessing systems remotely, um, in a lot of cases, you know, you can turn this on yourself. It will be available, but it may not be turned on for you. So for example, it's pretty easy for Google, for Gmail, and a lot of people use Gmail or for Office 365 to turn on some form of two-factor authentication. 
if for heaven's sakes you're a small business and you're not using two-factor authentication when you work with your bank, absolutely turn it on now. Um, and those things may be just really checking a box in um, the in the settings of a system. Um, that is very, very effective. Um, and for those of you who run small businesses, if you've got to take action, I'd recommend that you consider doing that as well. The third thing, and this is actually the simplest thing for pretty much anybody to do, um, I'd recommend using a protective DNS service. So, you know, I'm not sure about the overall level of expertise of our listeners, but you probably know that DNS is the phone book of the internet, the domain name system. So if you type in rstreet.org in your browser, DNS is the service that looks up R Street's domain and says, here's the actual IP address that goes with that. Here's where your browser should go to get the data that you want to see. Well, it turns out that DNS is not used just for browsing. Um, it is used for browsing, but it's used for a whole variety of things, including a lot of um, command and control for malware. So DNS can be a very effective way to protect people broadly because the DNS service, instead of, if you put threat data, the kind of threat intelligence that's available to um, entities like site.io, um, um, if you put threat data into a DNS service, if, it, if you request access to a known bad site, for example, you click on a link in a phishing email, you know, maybe it's not rstreet.org, but rsstreet.org, then the domain name system, if it knows that's bad, can tell you that site, for example, does not exist. And as a result, you don't get phished. It can also limit command and control. This is as simple as going into the settings on your computer. Um, it literally takes less than two minutes and changing the, I, changing the DNS service that you use to whatever your ISP provides to a service, a domain name service that protects your, um, that provides a protective DNS service. Um, I will tell you, we help set up one called Quad9. So the IP address for that is 9.9.9.9, .9 which is called Quad9. It's really simple to use, but there are other good services out there um, that are possible to use. Cloudflare has one. Um, I believe OpenDNS is still out from Cisco. So there are other services you can use that are, that are effective also to block access to malicious sites. So to keep that really simple mes messaging, patch, use multi-factor authentication, and um, use a protective DNS service. One of the things that we did is we built a coalition of nonprofits. Um, uh, Bryson, we'd, we'd, we'd welcome um, ICS Village to join us, but I'll put the, um, oh, let's see. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Someone but it is, at the bottom? Yeah, I've got the link, but it's got, um, um, it is not showing desktop. We'll just do that. Okay. All right. I'm not going to do it because I don't have Zoom set up to be able to share my desktop screen. So I'll talk to you about it instead. And I'm not going to change my system settings um, on, on the fly here. Um, the uh, We've got a site that's up and available that all of these nonprofits, our street is one of them. It all, the site, the organizations that are also backing this work from home messaging and these, this proposal include the World Economic Forum, the Cyber Peace Institute, the Cyber Threat Alliance, a whole variety. Like I said, I think it's, we're up to 23 and I think more are joining today. If you wanna see that, you can go to the website workfromhome.globalcyberalliance.org and you'll see very clear instructions on how to go through and do these three basic things. Links to the resources, for example, our street resources on work from home. We'll be adding a link to uh, this webcast when it um, comes up and uh, because, oh, this is, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, that's My the pleasure. work from home site. Um, I'm glad we have somebody who's technical on, and can do this fairly readily on the, on the site. So um, you will see, and then there's a the list of the nonprofits on the left side. Um, you will see the messaging. Um, if, you if you have a little bit more time to do hy hygiene-related work, as opposed to just doing these three basic things, 
um, the this site and otherwise link to a general um, uh, guidance site, not a, just a guidance site, but a, a tool site for small business. So Paul, if you could do gcatoolkit.org. So we GCA has built a cybersecurity toolkit called the GCA Cybersecurity Toolkit for Small Business. Like the work from home site, it's free. All the tools it contains are free. It's designed to not be just guidance, but actually a set of free tools you can use to implement the guidance. So this is the overall set of toolkits. Paul, if you could click on the small business site. There you go. Absolutely. Wow. So- um, Yes, you're seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. Um, so this is a site that addresses all 10 of the top um, 10 CIS critical controls. So besides just protective DNS and uh, patching and um, multi-factor authentication, yeah, you don't need to subscribe to our newsletter right now. Um, there are a bunch of other things you can do. So if you'll page down a little bit, you'll see six toolboxes. A little bit farther, there you go. So there's a number of other things that you can do here. For example, protect your email and your reputation is about um, using uh, a technology called DMARC to present, prevent phishing of your email. Um, there are other things like um, know your inventorying your systems and know what you've got. All simple things, everything in here is free. Um, but, uh, and this is by the way, you can't, I can't see it on here, but if you, um, if I move my window, if you look in the upper right hand corner, you will see a, a US flag icon, a French flag icon, a Spanish icon, and a German icon. Um, and that is because the toolkit is now available in four different languages. So it's available in English, in French, in Spanish, and in German. And that's native with all of the videos available in that language as well. So um, for any of you who might be located around the world who are, who are see this on the, the webcast, that's all um, available and usable um, in multiple languages. So the last thing I would say is, you know, so we've got this work from home site that a lot of entities, including R Street back, say here are three simple things to do. There's a broader set of free resources you can use and there's other small business resources out there you can use. Um, if you have questions and you need support, um, we've built a community forum so you can ask questions. So I might ask you to go to one more site, Paul, which is um, community.globalcyberalliance.org. Community? Community.globalcyberalliance.org. So this... See if it see if the the internet works from Costa Rica. Al, uh, it it works a little slowly, <laughs> uh, uh, especially when I'm also likewise video streaming and who knows what. There, there you go. Right. So if you could, this is our general community support site. But if you click on the work from home um, box, um, and this is linked to from. Uh, from that work from home site I started with. So these are areas about those three, patch to protect, how to protect your systems, sign in securely, how to use multi-factor authentication, how to use protective DNS. Um, there's a section on accessing the office safely if you're working um, remote from public locations like, um, like Starbucks, which is a lot less likely right now, a resources section and then a general section. So anyone can come in here and ask a question and people can provide responses. So it's a great resource. We check it regularly and try to respond to any question that's asked. Um, plus, as I said, we've got a, you know, we've got an expert community of partners. All of the, those 23 nonprofits have agreed to contribute here when, when we get questions. And so that's the last resource I'd call out for people. Um, I guess I'd say in conclusion, you know, as Bryson said at the start, you know, this is not new, right? This is, this is more of what the, we see in the same, but with some sp particular flavors here, particularly a greater attack surface area. Um, so 
the most important thing to do right now, and you may want to buy new cybersecurity gadgets, but the most important thing and the thing that everybody should do first is really double down on the basics. Um, it hasn't changed that the vast majority of intrusions start with phishing. Um, that's always been the case. As far as I can tell, it always will be the case. Um, and so you need to do some big things to help protect yourself from phishing. And then you can go on and you can do some more things. But definitely make sure your systems are updated. Consider using a protective DNS service. And to help stop phishing, use two-factor or multi-factor authentication if you can. And if you do that, um, you're, the, 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 the biggest part of your risk is gone. Um, I feel pretty comfortable in saying that's well over half your risk because um, you're going to massively cut back on phishing if you just do those few basic things. So, Paul, back to you. What's the work from home uh, site again? It's workfromhome.globalcyberalliance.org. And that, section, that page also has a resources page. So if you want more guidance, then there are links to... Um, the resources available from all our, our partner nonprofits that are supporting the messaging, including all of their work from home advice and those sorts of things. Okay. Okay. I, there was a request to post it in chat, but yeah, no, I, I got it. Good deal. So thank you, Phil. Um, you know, uh, I, your, your final admonition that, that uh, phishing is remains, you know, the singularly most uh, significant thing reminds me of, of an incident that literally happened yesterday where we, everybody at R Street got an email that was uh, for anti-phishing training that we were all supposed to take. And I deleted the email because I thought it was a phishing attempt <laughs> to sell, um, only, only to find out that, uh, that it was real. Uh, and so I, I actually have to go back to my IT person and, and uh, then, uh, tomorrow and, or later today and ask her to resend it so that I can take the training because I deleted it permanently because I thought for sure it was, um, it was not real. Uh, but there you go, uh, uh, life is like that. So uh, I wanna thank you both for your, 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 your discussion. We've got some questions here. I wanna remind everybody that the Q&A, the question and answer queue is open. Feel free to uh, ask some questions. Uh, I'll, I'm going to read them out because not everybody on the in the attendee list can see the, or hear the questions. Uh, so uh, the first one I think is going to be for you, Bryson. Uh, would you please summarize the best practices that we should use when hosting or participating in a Zoom meeting, and also ask and answer whether Google Hangouts, Cisco WebEx, and Skype are more secure or less, and why or why not? So uh, to iterate what I was saying earlier, when you're on somebody else's infrastructure, when you are working in the cloud, um, you have to um, work with what you can do. And so the starting point is controlling access. That starts with um, OPSEC, operational security. If you can't find my meeting, then it's hard for you to do something with it. So um, limiting where you share that information, uh, certainly the most famous one of those was a couple of weeks ago when uh, Boris over in England uh, posted a picture of him in the entire cabinet and you can see the meeting ID. Um, this is a kind of a joke that we see a lot in information security where you have a picture of in a work environment and then you can see people's passwords pasted up on top of the computer. So starting with operational security, um, restricting access, um, adding passwords, limiting it to who can join. Um, other than that, they're all fundamentally the same as long as, we're else, as long as we are on somebody else's infrastructure. The only thing that you can do to try to change anything is whenever you are able to control the infrastructure that something else is going over. So, so then from your perspective, it doesn't, uh, you know, setting passwords for access to Zoom meetings, controlling who can share, not, not terribly useful or useful enough or worth oh. doing or not? No, absolutely worth doing, right? So we're, we're controlling access. We make it harder to find us. We're making it harder to get in. Um, and that's, that's the key part to reducing interaction. Okay. Um, so, and you don't have any, any preference or choice between Google Hangouts and Meet and, and Zoom and Skype video? 
Here we are on Zoom. Well, that's because that's what's cheapest for our street. <laughs> there <Yeah>. you go. <laughs> if you told us to change, we probably would, dude. No, um, I, I mean Google Chats is free. Um, I, I, they're all they're all roughly the same. There, there's no one that I would pick on more than the other. Um, I think all of them are roughly equivalent. Okay, fair so enough. So, Paul, I might contribute okay, something no, here. Ahead. You know, just one thing I'd note is. If you don't need functionality, don't have it. Um, and so I, I will tell you, I mean, and I'm not going to bash Zoom. I, I like Bryson, think they responded pretty quickly. When, when, when the word came out about what were clearly systemic security and privacy vulnerability or governance failures at Zoom, um, I had my organization uninstall the Zoom client. We would just use the web app across all of the pieces. And we haven't reinstalled it yet. I think they've taken really good action, but I'm, I'm actually giving it a little bit of time. And I do give them kudos for their response. Um, I actually had to reinstall it to be a panelist here. That was the trick how I was able to get on as a panelist. Like I couldn't be a panelist from the web app, at least that I was able to do. Um, but I will uninstall the um, the Zoom client for my computer as soon as I'm done with this because normally I'm fine with the web app. I don't need the functionality. You know, the risk from a zero day in that is really low to me. But you know, it takes me two or three minutes to reinstall it in the future. So my preference is to do that. I would just say, you know, there's every app you install, every new service you're running increases your attack surface area. So don't keep what you don't need well that's that's probably great advice for every every type of of uh enterprise activity that you could you could possibly want right yes yeah so okay uh we have another question this one i'm going to start with you phil um since you said you started talking about basic hygiene uh uh, uh one of our our, our attendees asked how important is it to change passwords frequently? And what do you think is the best way to securely manage your passwords needed for the various systems, apps, devices, et cetera? So password management. What's, so what's your I'd say I don't advise people to change passwords frequently anymore. The really rapid rotation I think is probably negative. Um, it's much better to have really complicated, complex passwords that you don't change than to try and have a system that you use that, you know, you're just going to have a lot of churn. You're going to have trouble remembering the passwords. And so um, I would say my, uh, we don't give advice anymore to change passwords frequently. Um, we give advice to have complicated passwords. It's still a good idea to change them periodically because, you know, sometimes services have compromises and passwords get out there, or at least hash passwords get out there. And so it, it, it makes some sense, but I don't think it's that important to rotate them really frequently. And do Inter you use mm -hmm. a password locker or a, you know, like LastPass or 1Password? Or, or yeah, I, I think that a, a really, really good way to handle passwords um, is to use a password manager. Um, it's also good to, you know, try to have as few passwords as possible. Um, it's good to use, as I said before, multi-factor authentication. And if you don't have access to a good and strong password manager or you're concerned about it, you know, I'm going to give some really heretical advice, um, which is not in your work environment, but if you've got a secure home environment, get out a legal pad and write your password passwords down on a sheet of paper and keep it in a locked drawer. Um, that's a better way um, to keep passwords than to reuse a password. So if the choice is that, then, you know, that's another thing you, you can do. You know, finally, you know, another thing you can do is if you don't, you know, if, if, if you only need to log in and you can stay logged in sometimes, don't even worry about what the password is. You know, have your computer select it and don't worry about remembering it. And if you need to log in or get it in the future, just reset your password. Um, I, I think there are lots of ways to go forward. The, the key is don't reuse passwords. Don't use simple 
passwords like password one or password one, two, three, or even in the Washington DC area, redskins or redskins exclamation point, right? Don't do any of those things. And that's, that's the most important piece. Bryson, you got anything you want to add on passwords? Uh, the expert who originally pushed the password guidance that we now are all stuck with has came out last year and said he was horribly wrong. He apologizes to all of human civilization for what he's done to us, which is effectively what Philip has, was, has said here, which is the key is users should be able to remember their password. That is um, the constant churn, the forgetting, the administrative overhead of all of that was far worse than the fact that an attacker might have compromised a password and be able to use it. Okay, well, that's good. So we got another question here. Um, Phil mentioned DMARC as the GCA toolkit. Uh, that reminded me of an old question I have in mind. Do you guys know of any company that successfully configured DMARC to the reject policy. I'm not sure I even understand the question, uh, and perhaps um, uh, Zhao can clarify it, but if that's clear to you, Phil, maybe you can try it. And if not, hopefully uh, Zhao, I hope I'm even saying that right, can, uh, can amplify that question in, in, the, in the Q and A. So Phil, does that- Yeah, question sure, I'm I understand the question and I'm happy to answer it. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, DMARC is um, a protocol or um, a process that you can, if you own a domain, can use to prevent what is called direct domain spoofing. So if, um, if our street had implemented DMARC, it could be used to prevent someone from spoofing an email that actually said it came from rstreet.org. Um, because if a recipient had also implemented DMARC, and by the way, all the big webmail providers have, something like 90 or 95% of email around the world is now protected by DMARC on the receiving end, um, then you as the domain owner could say, I want you to do one of three things. I want you to let it through. Um, I just want to know if you're getting email that's spoofed from me, but let it through. Um, that's P is equal to none, or policy is equal to none. The second level is quarantine, which is send it to spam. So don't delete it or send it to spam. And the last, the highest level, which the question is asking about, is P is equal to reject. And that means delete it. Hard delete it, don't deliver it, you know, kill it, kill it, kill it. Um, and it's really important to do DMARC because DMARC prevents someone from attacking your customers. It's especially important, by the way, for people like lawyers and consultants that have a lot of access to customer data and send a lot of doc documents to customers. But um, so Zhao says, Yao says he works at a bank and he's getting up to 50% of his email reported to us as spoofed, which seems to me like an unreasonably high rejection rate. Perhaps that's right. I don't know. But is that, is that, that I'd have to know more detail, but I will say the other part of the question was have people um, deployed DMARC at reject. And yeah, the answer is a lot of people have now been able to do that. Um, you know, in terms of smaller entities, the global cyber alliance is at P is equal to reject. Um, in terms of there are a lot of larger companies that are done. I believe Aetna, Aetna is at P is equal to reject. I believe Bank of America for a big bank is at P is equal to reject. So it is, it, it, you know, it's important to do right because if you don't do it right, your email is going to get rejected, but it is possible to do and a lot of entities, not as many are at P is equal to quarantine or P is equal to none, but a lot of entities have now deployed successfully at P is equal to reject. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Um, so uh, the queue is empty right now. If anybody has any other questions, I have a couple that I'm going to uh, throw on the table right now uh, uh, for, uh, for the panelists. But if anybody who's an attendee has another question they want to ask, now is the time to put it into the queue because otherwise we're getting towards the end of the hour and we're probably going to you know, ease on down the road here a little bit. Um, 
So I, I have, I have a, a, a further uh, question for both of you. Um, in this current environment, what worries you the most? What is the one thing that you're most afraid of happening uh, 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 today? That uh, uh, maybe you've already discussed it and you want to amplify on it, but what is the single greatest risk? And then parallel to that, what's the optimal thing that we need to do right now to mitigate that risk today? What's the worst thing? I'll, I'll start with you, Bryson. I, I don't. I don't know the. I don't have something yet. <laughs> okay, I'll go to Phil, and then and then we'll go back to Bryson. So, I will say, my 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 greatest fear um, hasn't changed remarkably. In other words, it's it's pretty much the same as it was before this crisis, um, at least in terms of IT. Um, and the, the, the thing I, I remain most worried about as, you know, the greatest uncontrolled attack vector right now remains the Internet of Things and the massive number of devices that are out there that are wholly unsecured. Um, and, I mean, there are new threats to that. For example, you know, we know about Mirai and all of the things that can happen with baby monitors and VCRs and all of those things. But, you know, there's – it's just – it is the norm for um, for those IoT devices to be unsecured. You want something really simple to do? Just ha you know, take over a much broader, assemble a bunch of vulnerabilities, default passwords that are available out there, build a massive set of botnets, and start eating up bandwidth and knocking ISPs off, or you know, taking people individually down on a home by home basis. Um, so where everybody is working remotely um, and we don't have firewalls and we're all using the main backbone, we are much more vulnerable to uh, denial of service attacks. And of course, with, you know, with IOT devices, you can do a lot more. You can, you know, <laughs> if you start bricking a number of IOT devices, how are we going to go out and replace them, Right. Um, if, if, uh, if a vast number of thermostats go down and start messing with things, if people lose their televisions, um, if people lose their routers, it's going to be really significant. So um, the, the ability to use DDoS and the ability to do widespread bricking of devices that cannot be readily replaced in this environment is probably a thing that, that keeps me up the most at night right now. Okay, well, that's, that's a good answer. I see that Bryson has put a, uh, a YouTube video of a talk that he gave on IoT insecurity into the chat for anybody who's an attendee who wants more of Bryson than, than they've already gotten. Um, Bryson, uh, you want, have you thought of an answer now? Yes. Uh, so following on the, the IoT thing real quick. So um, in addition, what I go through in that talk is I break down all of the different kinds of campaigns um, I show how to do that. And to me, the biggest risk with IoT is that it is uh, going to what Philip had talked about earlier about delete everything you don't need. Well, the problem is that IoT by definition is the opposite of that. It is increasing functionality, computer functionality and computational capacity that we are exponentially adding around us. And even if it is not directly connected to us, it can still affect us. And all of that represents surface area um, that provides vector and lateral movement opportunity for an attacker. So it's less that I'm attacking your IoT and it's more around what your IoT can get me access to that I find of interest. And so I show in that talk some really funny examples of how to, how to do that, laterally move within somebody's house, steal all of their stuff of interest, and more importantly, how to do that times tens of thousands of folks and then I provide a take-home lab with um, the actual vulnerability in the code um, and emphasize that you should only do this on your own equipment um, to show how you can demonstrate do that in the comfort of your home. Um, with respect to what I see as the biggest risk in the interim, we don't know how long this virus and this pandemic are going to affect us the way we are, right? Everybody is already committed to the next week, few weeks, months, year, um, I've seen an article recently come out that says without a vaccine that we can expect a situation like this through 2025 is unimaginable as that is. But the point is for some period of time, 
we are all physically constrained with what we can do. And in critical infrastructure, when there is an issue, part of what makes critical infrastructure so unique is the physical reality of it, right? We're not talking about just abstract code on a computer that can have ones and zeros going through something. We're talking about the fact that your lights can actually go out, that water can go, all of the things that we depend upon as a modern society would not be there in our world and would physically alter that world. And <coughs> our ability to respond to incidents is going to be crippled or reduced by the fact that um, the responders themselves become more vulnerable, of course, to the virus through that kind of response. Um, and so I'm not trying to doomsday scenario here, but I would say that's a big risk right now is we have an additional level of complexity with human exposure to be able to respond to something. Whereas for most computer incidents, we don't necessarily have to physically be there to respond. Well, that's actually fascinating. Uh, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're absolutely right. It, it, the distancing actually has a, a non-cyber effect on physicality of cyber systems that I hadn't really thought about. That's Okay, so I'm going to, there are no more questions. I've got one last one, and we're going to change that topic and say, okay, what makes you the most optimistic? What is the good thing that's happening now? that either is unexpected or that you see as, as working well? And, uh, and why should we not go away from here uh, ready to shoot ourselves in the head because, uh, because, uh, because we're afraid of our dependency on all of this stuff? What's good that's happening in cyber today? Uh, and I'll start with you, Phil, because I, I asked Bryson first last time and he said he need more time to think, so I'll give him time. Phil? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'd say a couple of things. Um, on the non-technical side, I think the, the need for community has never been clearer. And so I see, I think, very hopeful signs of people putting aside their immediate profit motive um, and working together more as a community to broadly raise the level of cybersecurity around the world. I mean, just one example is that I, I talked about that work from home messaging that 23 global nonprofits all get together for the same messaging. You know, I think that's pretty powerful. And you see things, you know, Microsoft just um, yesterday, I think, announced that they're extending their Office 365 APT protection free of charge to healthcare organizations and humanitarian organizations. So I think that's really hopeful. Um, the other thing I'd say is there are technical strategies that I think bear hope for a scalable cyber defense. Um, these haven't, you know, I, I, and I think that the, the pandemic and the new environment we've got um, may accelerate movement toward them. You know, I'll just briefly, because I know we're short on time, just say, you know, for me, it's all about making sure things are secure by near default um, and that we back them up with automated collective defense. Um, so cross product boundaries, ways to automatically detect and reduce. And those are going to be even more important in a distributed environment for all the reasons that Bryson just talked about. So um, I, I, I think we're going to have accelerated um, movement towards those sets of broad technical solutions that work, technical and other solutions that work outside of a set of corporate firewalls. Okay. Um, Bryson? Yeah, so uh, there has also been um, in the threat intelligence community um, a bunch of researchers who came together um, uh, giving back to free to the community on behalf of this. So that's, that's another highlight. Um, I think that one highlight that's going to come out of this has been that uh, organizations that have been resistant to work from home were forced to do it. And it will be uh, obviously now that they've, they've had to scramble to, to find this new reality, I think that that balance will be much easier in the future that working from home um, will not seem as, as strange, uh, will be more acceptable. 
uh, there, there was a, a study I saw once that the quality of life of an individual can be derived from what's the distance from their house to work and the grocery store. And that's the triangle of happiness. And the ability to flatten one of those where working from home is now part of the norm and is now more acceptable and can be done, um, I think will lead to more flexibility and a higher quality of life. So that's something I think that um, I hope that uh, this this is the silver lining out of what has been, of course, a global tragedy. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, there's a difference though between working from home voluntarily and working from home by, by force majeure, right? Yeah, uh, I, I'm with you on shortening that line. My office is is uh, 60 feet from my bedroom here in at, at my house, but but boy, it 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 it, it feels different when I do this because I have to than when I, give, when I do this that I want to. Uh, uh, so uh, with that, I think uh, we've reached the end of our time here. So uh, I wanna thank everybody for their uh, attendance. I wanna particularly thank our two panelists, Bryson Bort and Phil Reitinger. I wanna uh, 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 express appreciation to them uh, for their contribution to this discussion. I, I wanna remind everybody that uh, there were some links in the chats that a, an archive of this video is going to be up on the R Street website if you want to save it with your very best friends. Um, and that uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I, I, we here at R Street and at GCA and ICS Village and NSI and all the other institutions that we're affiliated with uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, for you to invite us into your homes. Uh, we didn't get to see you because that's not the way it works here, but you got to see us. And so with that, um, we're going to uh, sign off and say thank you to everybody uh, who's participated, all the attendees, all of the panelists. And I wish you all uh, a very cyber secure time in this age of pandemic and cholera. Take care, uh, pandemic and COVID, not cholera. I got Gabriel Garcia Marquez on my mind. Take care, everybody. And we'll end the meeting now. Bye-bye, one and all.